We'll start directly with a uh, short paper uh, working with nature's uh, log. I say it in Swedish for some reason. Initial design lessons for slow biotic games. And I'm not 100% sure who will be presenting. Is yes, it uh, Raf? That will be me, Stefan. Yes. So please share your screen, I guess. Okay. And you have eight minutes to present. Great. Okay. Uh, my name is Raphael from Queen Mary, and I'd like to just start the presentation by introducing two quick concepts. First is the, the paper talks about biology games. Now, these are hybrid games involving playful interactions between three agents, humans, computers, and non-human organisms. So unlike traditional games, which only involve humans and computers, Biotic Games, on the other hand, introduces a third non-human living entity, such as microbes, into the game. By the way, can you hear me? Okay. Um, and their movements are captured and tracked by the smartphone and its software, allowing the player to visualize the gameplay on the screen. Okay, and that's uh, a footage from Honest the Kim's paper. The second concept is a slow biotic game. One of the many types of interactions that occur in biotic gaming involve those between microbes and its external environment, whereby an input, let's say, for example, from a human player, results in a physical responses or outputs from the microbes. Now, many of the biotic games rely on these responses to progress the gameplay. So we define slow biotic games as those that are driven by slow responses of microbes, such as growth, which actually can take between hours or even days to produce meaningful outcomes for the game. Right, in terms of challenges that the paper addresses, um, they are based on Gerber et al's publication, which sets out various design rules for the biotic games. Now, we found some limitations on, of these rules, which talks about the expectations on how responsive uh, nature of microbes output should be look and feel in the design process. But effectively, it implied that uh, the rules does not recognize uh, that slow biological responses, for example, the cell growth, um, is a valuable design element. And we found this to be problematic because as this would actually limit the range of player experiences that one can have with the, the microbial world. And in relation to this, uh, the rule did not provide any practical guidelines on designing with slow biological responses. So the approach we took to address these challenges was to analyze an example of a slow biotic game that I had designed called uh, Mold Rush. Mold Rush is an online multiplayer game um, that rely on the growth and the death of real living microorganisms. The slow proliferation of the cells are streamed live on Twitch and players are invited to claim or destroy patches of colonies that appear before their eyes. And we evaluated three different aspects of the game. Three different aspects of the game, which was uh, the design process of Mold Rush, its resulting player experiences outcomes, and also the unexpected observations made during the analysis. Okay, and in terms of the outcomes of our evaluation, uh, we can draw on two sets of initial design lessons that could be carried forward. The first lesson is the concept of prioritizing visual aesthetics uh, over spontaneity. Now in fast gaming, fast biotic gaming, designers are encouraged to pick a characteristic of a microbe that are conducive to spontaneity and fast responsiveness, such as movement. And additionally, designers are encouraged to adjust the magnification of the microscopes uh, to make the cells appear faster on the gaming screen. On the other hand, for slow bite games, as we found out with the Mordorsch game, drawing our attention away from spontaneity, and focusing on enhancing visual aesthetics of the cells produce actually positive feedback from the players. The use of the scanner allowed the high resolution of the cells to be obtained, 
allowing intricate patterns of cell texture and morphology to come through and the ability to control the light exposure also contributed to the aesthetic aesthetics and as we know from the fast gaming uh, light may not be suitable for cells that react uh, to to light in quick time additionally um, we found adjusting nutrient medium to higher viscosity helped to retain the integrity of the cells over a long period of time The second lesson was to address the uh, potentially negative effects of prolonged hardware performance. As the duration of the game is longer for slow biotic games, which can last for days or weeks, the so-called welfare of the, both of the microbes and the computer hosts should be considered carefully. It's widely known that CPUs and other electronic components can overheat, but this can also have a knock-on effect on the cells that are, that are residing within. So moldy ghosts uh, was a type of a, an unexpected glitch uh, that appeared in mold rush, where the overheated scanner forced the cells to overflow and effectively uh, sticking to the scanning device. So the cells eventually died, but they still appeared as ghosts that could not be removed from the gameplay. Similarly, yeast invasions uh, resulted from the architecture of the scanning device itself which allowed easy access for the contaminants to invade the gameplay. So here, an unknown aggressive strains of yeast cells literally hijacked the gameplay, effectively freezing it. So to summarize, uh, the overall take home message, I guess, for this paper um, is to encourage designers to take on a more of a post-humanist approach to biotic game design, which is to embrace the diversity of uh, biological characteristics, including those involving biological responsiveness. Secondly, we encourage designers to harness whichever distinct quality that the micro possesses, adopting the mentality of designing around the microbes rather than designing for traditional expectations imposed by the human-centered and popular game designs. We also made some initial recommendations on designing for slow biotic games, which included the concept of prioritizing visual aesthetics over spontaneity, as well as considerations for the prolonged hardware performance. And the major limitations of the paper is that our design lessons were based on only a single game evaluation and therefore needs further evaluation and validation through additional game designs and testing. And that's pretty much it. Uh, thanks for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, chat here or you can contact me online uh, via email. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you have already have one question in the chat. If uh, biotic games always involve microbes, could you have versions with cats or dogs or other pets? Yeah, so um, animal computer interaction, ACI is obviously um, fairly well established still within gaming and also in HCI. So, so yes, I mean, um, bigger animals uh, that are more sophisticated and are sentient animals, uh, they can be also be considered as biotic games. But I made a conscious decision to kind of steer away from larger species because of, I mean, I, I suppose it kind of complicates the discussion in terms of ethics and how the game should be designed. So I made a made a decision to, to separate that, yeah. But I, yeah, I do acknowledge that ACI is a, is a big field. There's also a question if you have looked at uh, games that can be played over mail or email, like diplomacy and chess and so on for inspiration. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the whole point of um, designing games like this was to, well, I was inspired by the slow gaming movement, which allows the player to really kind of reflect and contemplate and take their time in their gameplay, which also, you know, is a, is a genuine uh, source of enjoyment. Um, so I guess it's a part of a, a critique to the, the fast gaming movement, I, I suppose, yes, but definitely an inspiration. There's a paper you could look up from my former colleagues about slow technology. All right, is that? <laughs> Which might be relevant, <laughs> might be relevant. It's, it's old now, but yeah. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so you kind of 
your definition kind of, of biotic games was that there was a human and a computer and a biotic part or bacteria in this uh, or micro. Um, of course, when you do computer games, you can use it to let somebody play a game, play it against other humans, but also play against a computer. The result you have here, is there any kind of support for designing these types of games so the microbes can be considered another player? Uh, I, I guess so. I mean, with Modrush, but also in other games designed by those from um, Stanford University, they, I mean, the Euglena Pac-Man example I showed in the in the very first slide is actually you know taking a part in the gameplay as a as a character itself, but I guess the main question is whether those players have agency, whether they actually know that they are playing a game, or not. That's another question. Um, well, uh, people are happy to be, uh, play against computer opponents also, so as long as it seems that they have intentionality, it can be okay. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, and I suppose that draws on the comparison between an artificial intelligence over something that's more organic and biological. Um, mm. There are talks about intelligence, so-called intelligence in microorganisms like slime molds, for example. They can actually make intelligent decisions uh, over a maze, for example, on finding mm. food. Um, so I guess there might be a room for researching how that plays out in the gameplay. Um, but mm. that's that's something that I haven't considered. It's a, there's a comment in the uh, chat about considering slime molds as good uh, city planner agents and city building games. So yeah, yeah, that's yeah. So mm. microbial intelligence is a it's a kind of hot topic in uh, biocomputing. Um, a guy called Adam Adamadeski, he's a uh, kind of championing the research on how slime molds could be considered as a organic computer. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there, there was a question to me actually, because I had mentioned the paper, I'll send the link to the digital library at ACMS for that. It's a slow technology designing for reflection. Um, if people are interested. So, uh, the next one is a video, uh, why are crypto kitties not gambling? Alicia Serrada, I'm not sure uh, the presenter is here. Uh, yes, you're here. Yes, you... yes, I'm here. Probably I don't need to share my video, right? No, you don't need to. Okay. No. So, yep, it's uh, and uh, you're going to speak over the video? No, just play the video. It has my voice already. Great. Sorry. Then, yeah. um, yes, press start. Take guide. The certainty of outcome has always been present in games and playing games has always invited many fault forms of gambling and betting. Gambling typically means wagering something of value on an event with an unpredictable outcome. Gambling has undergone several cycles of marginalization and normalization in modern societies. Most lately, chance mechanics in digital games and betting practices around them have led to the gamblification of sports and competitive video games. It is commonly agreed that luck is seen as a central way to make games fair. Democratic games of chance provide equal opportunities to all participants, regardless of their skill and social status. And recent development of blockchain technologies and their application to games uh, has made their algorithm transparent and even more fair in some sense. However, such games are often criticized for lack of the actual gameplay and speculative tendencies, as well as for their close ties to gambling. One of the best-known blockchain-based games based on chance mechanics is CryptoKitties, a browser game on the Ethereum platform, published in 2017. It is similar to many pet breeding simulators, such as Ovipets and Dragon City, not to mention the Pokemon franchise. The principal difference is that you have to pay a fee in a very real cryptocurrency Ether to breed virtual pets. This fee is paid to execute a smart contract that eventually leads to the birth of a new kitty. This kitty will have a randomly assigned set of unique attributes, such as shape and color of its body parts. A combination of two attributes may result in a mutation when a new attribute reveals itself. This may increase the kitty's value. So, are CryptoKitties gambling? 
Based on a set of criteria derived from Griffiths, Shorten and colleagues conclude that CryptoKitties, as well as other Ethereum-based games, fit the definition of gambling and should be supervised as such. However, what else is there, apart from the unpredictability? Kitties are unique non-fungible Ethereum tokens, kept in an Ethereum wallet. Players can breed, sell and buy kitties. These are three meaningful choices available within the game system. There is also free play, unrestrained by the game rules. It happens on external platforms for trading and communication such as Discord, Twitter, OpenSea and other less used digital spaces. The game itself can be described as a player journey between aleatory points and decision-making points. The course of the game is changed upon passing these points and it depends, depends either on luck or on skill. For example, the act of breeding is a typical aleatory point with an uncertain outcome, but it's preceded by a decision-making point when a player chooses partners for breeding. Due to transparency of blockchain, a player always knows the probability of a desirable mutation. It is approximately 7% or less for the highest level attributes. However, player actions do not affect the outcome when the breed button is activated. And the main game mechanic does not differ much from a slot machine in this regard. CryptoKitties deviates from the mainstream understanding of a game in one crucial aspect. The game does not have a final goal. It shares this feature with sandbox games and social games, such as farming games and pet breeding simulators, but also World of Warcraft and other role-playing games. However, unlike other games that are not games, this one is a pre-programmed closed system, and it actually has the end goal. The ultimate goal of the game would be to breed the Queen Bee, a kitty whose attributes are all of the highest level. While many players acknowledge these goals, very few of them actually pursue it. As an additional technique of engagement, the game uses a well-known mechanic of completing a collection, widely used in playable media from children's sticker books to a game Pokemon. Cat Codex, a sticker book of the game, has empty slots for every possible attribute. A player is supposed to feel the urge to complete their collection of kitties, in the same way a jigsaw puzzle is complete. Many players fill in the cat codex, a complete genome, as it is called in the community. This quest is not particularly difficult, as it's only a matter of your budget. You can buy just any kitty on the marketplace in just two clicks, although the prices vary wildly. A more challenging approach would be to fill the cat codex with kitties that have gems. The first 500 kitties who underwent a certain mutation have these ones, which make them uncommon but not actually scarce. Kitties with gems are also more expensive. The lowest level gem, the blue lapis, raises the kitty's price somewhere around Ethereum 0.01. It provides an interesting challenge to a poor kitty peddler like me to fetch lapis kitty's uh, price below Ethereum 0.01 on the market. Although a bot would do it better, and such bots actually exist. But let's try it anyway. As you can see, the only attribute that I'm missing here is Foghorn Pohorn. There are two common ways to obtain this kitty, to buy it in the market or to breed one myself. I need a feather brain and a demon wings to breed a unique lapis Foghorn Pohorn. Its generation also matters, as it drastically influences the price of a kitty. I have a generation 3 lapis feather, horn, and feather brain already, but my demon wings kitties are generation 5 or older, which makes them garbage. So I turn to the marketplace for a generation 3 demon wings that I would breed with my kitty gener generation 3 kitty. And the resulting kitty would be generation 4, which is still somehow valuable. The chance to get a foghorn pohorn from two kitties with appropriate genes is around 14%. Even though my actual chances to get valuable kitty are low, I still decide to take the risk and breed with this kitty for 0.009 ether, a fee which goes to the owner of this kitty, plus a transaction fee of 0.008 Ether, which I pay to miners to generate a random new kitty. I also hope that the kitty will inherit the environment, my parade, because kitties with interesting environments tend to sell a little better. There are two more mutations possible with a 14% probability, hacker eyes and a splat pattern. I'm not going for them specifically, but it still would be nice to get any of them.
Unfortunately, the resulting kit has no promising attributes whatsoever. For me, it means the loss of 0.017 Ether, which is not that much, but still equals to around a quarter of a US dollar at the time of playing. I still have some Ether left from my previous, more successful operations, so I go to the marketplace again and find a foghorn pohorn that I personally like for aesthetic reasons. I pay 0.025 Ether for it, which is not cheap by my standards, but it leaves me satisfied. My wild element collection is now complete. Like other pet breeding simulators, CryptoKitties does not set explicit goals for the player. Like a slot machine, it requires inputs of small sums of money to generate new kitties of random value. Besides, players can set their own goals and make decisions only partially afforded or assisted by the official game system. With my analysis, I have demonstrated how mechanics of chance in the game are complemented by strategic breeding and trading, and these activities require a very specific knowledge of the game and sometimes a skill set of a professional cryptocurrency trader. By combining both gambling-like and strategic elements, CryptoKitties has gamified the Ethereum platform and became a noticeable factor in adoption of blockchain technologies. Thank you very much. Uh, I would Thank say you. we we let one person ask a question uh, using video and so on. Uh, others can ask questions, of course, in the chat. This can be ongoing in the next presentation. But since we're trying to catch up, I think I'm going to be trying to squeeze things. And maybe we can have a discussion at the end. Is there somebody who wants to uh, ask a question to set up? I see a question about the price. So I used to play the game with really, really low stakes because, um, well, it is expensive. And uh, whales and core players, they invest, for example, 10 Ether, sometimes, I don't know, 50 Ether, and it would be like multiplied by $200. But it depended because the uh, cryptocurrency exchange prices changed a lot and i mean like tenfold so the prices were the most interesting part of the game unfortunately this part is kind of dying out right now they are moving the game to another platform so the speculation is not going to be that wild but it's it was an interesting time mm -hmm. thank you for that explanation uh, i think we should give applause um, if you can use the reaction uh, possibilities here and i welcome uh, Henrik Larfeldt to uh, present his uh, paper micro level examination of games using indicator analysis thank you thank you let's see if i can share screen here here we go and you can still hear me i hope Yes, you can see that me. All right, so hi, I'm Henrik. This is a paper, uh, talk paper called Microlevel Examination of Games Using Indicator Analysis. Uh, when I wrote this paper at Uppsala University, but I have since to move on, and I am now at Sodotone University. So in case there's any confusion about the titles and everything. Uh, so the, let's see if we can get this to work. The problem that I'm trying to solve here is that we as academia have produced a number of artifacts to describe what constitutes good game design. And I realized the, the inherent problem of telling academia this is a problem when the session chair is famous for producing these things. So just bear with me here. Um, unfortunately, these things seem to have reached kind of low acceptance among game devs where we don't really see them using this, this all that much. And this sort of arose from, these insight arose from when we started actually surveying game devs and they went basically, why are you showing us this? We don't care. Um, so what we found is that our artifacts that we produce as a community are a little too prescriptive and it comes off as us trying to tell game designers what makes for a good game and they sort of seem to take that as who are we to tell them how to do their job uh, which i can on some level understand right how, who are we as non-designers to come and tell the designers how to do their job well i think there's some space for us to at least try to help guide people because if this is the expectation, I think people who've been at this conference so far see where this is going, uh, and this is what you deliver, then maybe there's some space for at least improvement here, right? But I think that maybe the way we've been going at this is, as a community has been not entirely correct. 
So we start rethinking this problem. Um, what if we focus on avoiding bad game design? So instead of trying to tell them, here's how you should do your job, we give them tools that say, is this maybe this stuff that's a problem with your design? Like, is this how you can identify uh, bad design? And how can we explain that why this design is well, bad? This becomes especially important uh, when we have design that's created by, say, some kind of black box, like procedural content generation. To paraphrase Max Cherminsky from earlier this conference, we have some assets and then we put them in the machine that goes burr and produces some game content. And we don't really know what that machine does because there's so many people involved in building that machine that it's hard for us to keep track of exactly what's going to come out of it given certain inputs. And that creates sort of a, a, a disconnect between the designed intent and the final product when we have these game designers who are working with a system they didn't build, with assets they didn't build, uh, and they really have no way of conveying back to the programmers and the designers how they need some kind of uh, change to this, the thing that's being input here and that's the thing that's making the uh, aggregated artifact. So to this end, I've created something called the indicator analysis model. And it's sort of a model of how we could perform what's called indicator analysis, which is something we're going to get to in a couple of slides. Uh, this is essentially borrowing a lot from Hassan Saul's uh, model of user experiences. But basically, when we look at how a game is created in, in this theoretical framework, uh, you have, you select the number of, as a designer, you select a number of product features. You have some content you want to put in the game. Say, we want there to be pirates. Uh, you have some kind of presentation. Do we want cartoony art style or do we want like a super serious art style? Uh, some kind of functionality. Let's say this is now a, a first person shooter and we have some kind of interactions that we want to perform here. So obviously shooting people, but also maybe we want to be able to drive boats. And the designer then from the, the this sort of collection of ideas creates some kind of intended experience. Uh, which will have different attributes. Some of them will be pragmatic, which means that these are attributes that we need for the game to function. So how do we uh, actually move our character around the, the game? How does that work? And some of them are hedonic. So how, what that makes the game nicer to use? Uh, not necessarily, like these necessarily, you know, what needs to be fulfilled are the pragmatic attributes to actually work for the game to work, but hedonic attributes make for a better game. And when this sort of has been created as a game, we can decompose that into a pile of indicators. And indicators are just little markers in the game that tell us what something is about. If we take, for example, just the screenshot from GTA V, we have this entire, obviously similar from Los Angeles that we're, we're basically walking around in. And we have a character with a, a certain aesthetic and we see the, this like city view. So all these things that we see on screen, including the UI, tell us something about the game, what we, ex we should expect from the game and what kind of game it is. So all these are basically indicators. And when the player sees this from the game, they so take these indicators and they interpret them based on where they are right now and how they have, what experience they have. So when I, when I play a game, say on my switch on the bus, not that anyone does this this year, but you know, uh, normally, and I play a game back home in my living room, I have a very different situation, right? I'm physically situated differently, but I also have a different device that I'm playing on. The, the whole media experience is different. And depending on what I've played before, I will have certain expectations on these games. So when I look at this game, maybe I, have I will have different expectations than someone else who hasn't played any of the GTA games before and they will maybe, uh, maybe they played uh, the other one that I can never remember the name of. Um, and they will have the ex expectations that sort of feed into what they want from this game. And that will filter the, this, these indicators that we take in and it will lead to us performing some kind of interpretation. So we'll perceive what we can do with this game, sort of the affordances, if you will, of the game. And we have an, an experience we start expecting from this game. Like we want some kind of experience from this game and we're expecting it to be in a certain way. And what comes out of that is an actual experience. So this may be positive or negative, uh, but for we were, what we're trying to avoid is essentially a negative experience. But the key point here is that the experience that the player has is different from what the designer intended. And the core part of indicator analysis is finding out how, what is the difference between what the player actually experienced and what the designer intended and how that is different. So what we're doing with indicator analysis is focusing on details. So how do these details contribute to the holistic experience that the player had? Because they have an experience when they play a game, regardless of, of the quality of the game or the, the size of the game. 
Uh, but what we're trying to figure out is how is this design signaled as intended and, and in practice, and how is the design interpreted by the player? And if there's a mismatch, how did that happen and why? That's what we're trying to answer with indicator analysis. And if we start looking at things like we present this creature to the, the player and you have most of your players saying that this is your love interest, where it's, uh, this is an orc from Space Marine, by the way, when this is obviously a fairly not very loving creature, then maybe you've somehow contextualized the game experience in the, in the not most effective way for your, your players. So why do we need this? Well, um, we need a common language in the game creation process. So we, we as, as UX researchers, if we're performing that role as game designers or as programmers of a game, there needs to be some kind of common language to speak for us to, to be able to communicate around these things. And, and a lot of these, we can maybe alleviate some of the problems associated with this sort of black box design that we've had in, in many games, No Man's Sky being a good example of this. Um, and this is sort of why PCG artifacts are hard to analyze from start to finish, you know, from, from the, this pile of assets and possible combinations to the end artifact, because we don't really know how they, we, we kind of know how they came together, but not necessarily how that would affect and how these would interact. So the extension of, of why we would use this is to make PCG more viable as simply a design tool, to make it more democratic, basically, to make it e easy for smaller studios or studios with less resources to do extensive testing to just try to just try to figure out and predict what their PCG machine is going to do when it goes burr. And that is the sales pitch of indicator analysis. Thank you so much. I think I'm still on time, right? I do think so. And uh, we'll you. reward you by letting two people ask questions if there's two people who want to ask <laughs> Thank questions. You. So do we have... You unmute yourself, wave, uh, write something in the chat. Could you say something while we're waiting for a question regarding what you said about the indicators? Is there a difference between things which are static elements, visual or audio maybe, which are kind of easy, or activities? So do you think like a, a building in the game world versus someone performing action in the world, for example? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, and it might be, let's say, mentoring is an experience that I'm teaching somebody to do something. Oh. Uh, uh, would that work also? Or is it this for so that's, things at a point in time? Yeah. That's an interesting question. So, so for, for things that are sort of made by the AI, so to speak, uh, that like sets a dynamic NPC behavior because of my history with, with studying NPCs. Uh, I think we would you see b different behaviors as indicators. And also we would see the house they're doing the behavior next to as an indicator too, because mm -hmm. all of these would sort of feed into the, the experience and understanding we have of the game, right? Mm -hmm. And thank you, yes, Jose, it was Saints Row. Mm -hmm. That was the game I never could remember the name of. The name of. Right. Um... It, it, I think we'll, since nobody else is lining up to ask a question, we'll try to save time for the end so everyone can ask. I do have one question, which is, I'm asking for a friend, what is good game design, but we'll leave that for later yep. uh, and, and move on. Thank so you. <laughs> thank you. And please, everybody, uh, give applause for Henrik for his presentation. And um, I will say, uh, Welcome. Is it uh, Quang who will be presenting? Yes, I see you here. Yes. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay. And you, the uh, paper presented will be an empirical study of the characteristics of popular game jams and their high-ranking submissions on itch.io. Please take it away. So can you uh, see my screen now? Can and we I can hear you. Yes, both okay. Both see the screen and hear you. Okay, um, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Kwang and uh, I'm a master's student from the Analytics of Software Games and Repository Data Labs or ASGARD Lab from the University of Alberta. So today I'll be presenting our paper on an empirical study of the characteristics of popular game gems and their high-ranking submissions on itch.io. 
So first I'd like to define what a game jam is. So it is an event where developers gather to make games in a short duration of time. So it's like a hackathon with a strong focus on game development. And uh, game jams are usually held at a physical location, but uh, there are many famous online jams such as the Game Maker Toolkit Jams or the Game of Jams organized by GitHub. So winning a game jam can be a great bonus to a developer's resume and help them in their career in the game development um, industry. And uh, BriarWorks focused on mining mobile app stores such as the Google's Play Store and the Apple's App Store for the characteristics of popular uh, mobile apps. And another set of prior works focus on mining Steam and other game mod distribution platforms such as the Nexus mods and uh, Curse Forge. So therefore, our study is the first to mine the H.io platform for the characteristics of games and gems. So for our study, we collected our data by mining the H.io platform using a customized uh, web crawler. And H.io is an online distribution platform which uh, focuses on indie games and allows hosting of online game gems. So currently it has more than 200,000 games and uh, more than 3,000 past game gems. And we collected several types of gem metadata, for example, the gem host, the number of submissions, the gem duration, and the gem ranking criteria. Similarly, uh, for game metadata, we collect uh, platforms, uh, uh, the genre, the, make, the, the technology that, that were used to make the games and the average session, play session, for example. So in our study, we proposed uh, two research questions. RQ1, what characterize uh, popular game gems? And RQ2, what characterize uh, high-ranking submission? So now I'll briefly go through the overview of our methodologies. So first we uh, crawl and clean the data from each.io. Then we separate the gems into competitive and non-competitive gems. So we consider the non-competitive gems are those without any ranking criteria. Then we select the top and the bottom 20% of gems based on the number of submissions. So we consider the top one as the popular gems and uh, the bottom ones are the non-popular gems. And similarly, we also select the top and the bottom 20% of games based on rankings. So the top one will be the high ranking games and the bottom one will be uh, the low ranking games. Then we perform some feature extraction and um, normalization to arrive at the final set of jam and game features. And uh, for the first research question, our motivation is to help future jam hosts know what to emphasize to make the jams popular. So if we investigate the most important features of popular gems through, uh, through a logistic regression model, and a feature gem hosts could use our findings to increase the likelihood of their gems being popular in terms of the number of submissions. And uh, uh, for our first finding, we found that gems that have a better description are more likely to be popular. So in particular, the description length and the number of images in the description are the among the top three most important features. So uh, popular gems have statistically significantly longer description and more images in their uh, description. They also have longer median uh, description length than uh, their non-popular counterparts. And uh, our, in our data set, about 67 to 73% of the gems uh, that have at least one image are popular gems. And secondly, uh, regarding the number of gems hosts, we also found that this is an important feature for our model and, and uh, popular gems have statistically significantly more hosts. And also in our data set, around 77 to 83% of the gems that are organized by more than one host are popular gems. And thirdly, it's about gem duration. Uh, we found that uh, this feature is, is uh, significant for competitive gem, but not significant for non-competitive gems. So gem duration has an inverse relationship with gem popularity. And uh, in our data set, popular competitive gems last a median of seven days, while non-popular competitive gems last a median of 11 days. 
So to summarize the key findings of the first uh, research questions, gems that have a better description tend to be popular and popular gems tend to be organized by more hosts and shorter competitive gems tend to be more popular. So moving on to the second research question, uh, our motivation is to help future gem participants increase the likelihood of their games being ranked high in the gems. And uh, we use the same logistic regression models and uh, so that we can study the different features of the high ranking and the low ranking games. And future gem participants can use our finding to understand what to focus on to improve their chance of uh, being ranked high. For the first uh, finding, it's quite similar to the previous uh, research question in that high ranking games tend to have a better description. So in particular, high ranking games have uh, statistically significantly long, more images and longer description than uh, their low ranking counterparts. And in our data set, high ranking games have a median of four images and more than 500 characters in their uh, description while low ranking games have two images and more than 300 characters. And uh, the second finding is about the number of developers uh, that make the games. We, we found that uh, high ranking games have uh, statistically significantly more developers and that 71% of the games that were made by more than one developer are high rankings. And third, third uh, finding is about the game genre. Um, so we found that puzzle, platformer, interactive fiction, or action games tend to be high rankings. So in, in particular, 63% uh, of the puzzle games, 59% uh, of the platformer games, 52% of the action games, and 51% of the interactive fiction games are all high ranking games. And finally, it's uh, regarding platform support. Uh, we found that games that support Windows or Mac OS tend to be high rankings, but games that support HTML5 or Android tend to be low rankings. And in our data set, 60% uh, of uh, the Windows games and 66% uh, of the Mac OS supported games are high ranking games. On the other hand, 57% uh, of the HTML5 games and 51% of the Android games are low ranking games. So to summarize the key findings of the second research question, uh, high ranking games in the gems tend to exhibit these character characteristics. Uh, they, they have a high quality descript uh, description. They tend to belong to either the puzzle, platformer, interactive fiction, or action genre. And they support Windows and Mac OS, and they they were developed by more than more developers. So uh, our study have uh, has implications for both jam hosts and participants. For jam hosts, uh, they should consider organized shorter competitive jams and co-organize with other hosts. For jam participants, they should consider making multi-platform and multi-genre games and participate in teams instead of in individually. And for both jam hosts and participants, they should consider improve the description quality of the jams and the games. Uh, so in conclusion, in the first part of uh, my presentation, I talk about the characteristics of the, pop, uh, the popular gems. In the second part, I talk about the characteristics of high ranking games in the gems. And finally, I talk about the implications for, uh, of our study for both gem hosts and participants. So yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And, uh, do we have any questions? I do, but I think I'm second on the list. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you say who you consider first? Um, so I'm just I'm trying to find a chat with those. Yeah, but Adam, if you think you're second, that means you know who's first. Uh, I think Serada posted first. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Me. I will just uh, read it. Well, thank you for this amazing presentation. And I wonder if it could be possible to include personalities of hosts, because in my experience, their own popularity is very important to promote events, the same as with the influencers. And also, which journals rank low? Like, 
what games should not be built by one person in 24 hours? Thank you. Um, so, uh, can you repeat your, the first part of the questions? If personalities of hosts, yeah. is that important? Um, Did you look at that? Um, no, uh, we didn't look at that because uh, we were not able to collect uh, that information from the H.I.O. page. And uh, for the second question uh, regarding the game genres, um, uh, we also did a study about like which genre should not be made because we focus on the characteristic of high ranking games, right? So we, we found that the, uh, for example, the Windows or the uh, Mac OS games uh, will tend to be associated with the high ranking games. Adam, i let you in for a question. Okay, uh, so yeah, thank you for the talk as well. It was, it was quite interesting. Now, I, I know that a good number of, say, universities, for example, like to use Itch to have just a way to host student games. And mm -hmm. that could be for a module for an assignment, for example. So they're not really like official game jams in that sense. And I, yeah. so I don't know how many there are, but I just wonder, have you considered maybe that could affect the data in some way? Um, we, uh, we did not filter for like uh, the university only gems. Um, but with this, uh, in, in our filtering process, we did filter gems that have like um, at least 10 submissions so that we can separate the top and the bottom uh, ranked games in those gems. So if the uh, university gems that have too few submissions, they might be omitted from our study. I'll, I'll throw, uh, did you have something more, Adam? No, I was just going to say, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, quick question. Did you have metadata to look at uh, reoccurring jams, which are annual or something else, and be able to draw any conclusions from that? Um, for re so, we consider on the uh, recurring jams at the as uh, separate gems on their own. Hmm. I think we have like a few uh, recurrence of the game maker toolkits in our data set, but we didn't consider that characteristic in, in the models. Hmm. So. Yep, thank you. We actually have six minutes left because everybody's been really good at keeping time and so on. Uh, this means that I'll open up for questions to all the uh, presenters. Does anybody have a question you want to ask? You can, of course, write them in the chat also. Um, anybody? I'll, uh, I'll go back. Um, oh, wow, there's, there's so yep. many questions. <laughs> so I'm just looking yeah, for and wonders when the game is over. Uh, and do you evaluate the aesthetics in the games or is it the player who can do that? Um, I mean, the game being over, I guess it's, yeah, that's, that, that's an interesting question because um, are we hum as humans, the, you know, the decider of when the game is over or are the microbes? Yeah, that's, that's another question, um, yeah. But the concept of dying is also very, very interesting in biotic gaming concept because, you know, in computer games, when a player dies, you know, it, that person dies in an electronic sense, but in a biological sense, it's actually real. So it's, um, it adds to kind of a um, free zone, I guess, to, to the dynamics of the gameplay. Um, yeah, moral, moral issues. Is it okay because you're actually killing something? That's, that's right, yeah. Oh. Uh, I do have a question to uh, Quang regarding the uh, game jams and so on. Uh, could you yeah. could you determine any kind of cultural differences and so on? I guess the, it's difficult in the metadata, but could you figure out where the host, where the jams were hosted, or which, where the participants were from, or is it like we're all one global family when it comes to this type of activity? Um, so I think. Uh the majority of gems on each.io are like online gems, so participants, they can be from anywhere. Mm. 
Okay, so which is both interesting and maybe problematic. Yeah. Um, I have another question. Did you you presented uh, present the few cents on, and you said that the Windows and the um, the Mac games were higher ranked in certain regards, and the than the other ones, the Androids and so on, were less. But the percent wise, it wasn't that big of a difference. Uh, you did point out how many, the size of the data, but did you do some more detailed uh, statistical analysis to kind of have probabilities that this was random results or some, do you have a confidence interval? Did you do that kind of analysis? Uh, yes, so on those uh, features that I mentioned, like, um, so let's say for the uh, Windows support, it's a binary features, right? It's just zero or one, whether they support Windows or not. And so for like the same for Android and uh, HTML5, so they, they are all statistical significant features. But uh, then I also did like um, uh, find out the feature importance. And uh, I think uh, in my papers, I mentioned that Android and HTML features, they are less important. So I think that's why the percentage is not very clear. Right? It's only 51 and above, not very 80 or 90 range. It's not in those ranges. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else who has questions? Hi. Hi, Sydney. Um, Ask away. I have a question for Juan as well. Um, Sarah does mention about the popularity of hosts and I got curious about the popularity of the participants. Uh, for example, uh, you, have you considered to which extent the number of followers of each I.O. submitters can influence these results, the ranking of the game? Um, oh, I, I didn't uh, consider that. Um, I think uh, most of the like the users on each the IO they are like um, well actually I, I don't know I, I don't I don't know the answer to that question. So uh, thank you for that uh, explanation. We we should move on now. There's one minute for the uh, until the keynote. So I will say thank you all for participating here. Thank, thank you for the presentations. Thank you for the questions and the discussions. And I guess it will be ongoing also on the Discord and so on. Uh, thanks, everybody. Go, go on and listen to the keynote.